good. Uh, can, okay, so, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jacob Penn. I work for Intel. And uh, in the past few years, been working on IOMU, but this topic is also um, x86 as well. So it's, it's good to see uh, some x86 people in the room. So thank you for attending. Um, first, I want to uh, acknowledge the people on this project. And uh, I'm not trying to pronounce all the names because I may not get it right. But for all those, also for those ones I can get it right, but you may not recognize uh, who I am talking about. So thank you. So um, I started working on this project because one, one time we were uh, working on a performance um, debugging case. And then uh, one of our uh, cloud engineer told me that um, when you have a lot of new uh, Gen 5 NVMe disks attached to your uh, to the same socket, our performance just dropped so quickly. So we were looking at the issue. It turned out to be uh, interrupt related. So this topic is about uh, how to uh, improve interrupt throughput and the making uh, new use of the old technology, which is posted interrupt on bare metal. So just a little background, uh, you know, IOMMU intro remapping has has been turned on for by default because the X to APIC <laughs> support. Oh, by the way, um, feel free to interrupt. Uh, it's better to make this uh, interactive. And so VTD has, or at, uh, most of the other IOMMUs, I attended uh, at the RISC-5 uh, talk two days ago about IRQ bypass and they all support remapped mode and the post mode in some form. So the post mode today is only used for uh, virtualization where uh, MSIs for a directly assigned device can be delivered to the guest kernel without hypervisor intervention. Oh, sorry, this slide is old. Mm. Okay. I updated the slide with some more diagrams. Sorry, this one doesn't have it. Um, but I'll just talk through it. So the uh, the, um, the hardware flow to deliver uh, interrupt is a continuous continuous flow from the device to the IOMMU and the IOMMU fetch the translation, uh, and then send a notification to the CPU. And the CPU deliver that uh, interrupt to the uh, to the OS handler uh, based on this vector and uh, the interrupt descri uh, descriptor table uh, mechanism. And so this flow is continuous in hardware uh, flow without software uh, touch points. So with a post the interrupt, the first two steps, the hardware, the interrupt generation and uh, acceptance into the system agent or IOMMU is the same. But what's really changed uh, is that um, this, the, uh, this now this, the interrupt delivery become two parts. One is posting to the memory and uh, the other part is send a notification to the CPU. The notification part actually can be controlled by the system software uh, as, uh, as needed. So the software can control when and if the notification is sent to the CPU. So this is through a, a memory resident descriptor uh, that both IMMU and CPU can touch. So the problem with that today is that um, when the interrupt arrives in a very high frequency, the, uh, the remappable interrupt we have today is very inefficient. Uh, if the CPU is already busy with uh, processing uh, interrupt handlers, and it, and then the IMU will still keep notifying, you know, there's more and more. It's kind of like driving a whole bunch of people, a uh, five-year-old, to the zoo, and you're already driving at a full speed, speed limit, but they're still keep asking, you know, are we there yet? Are we there yet? It just doesn't help. It's just a distraction, and they're gonna slow you down. 
So another another problem with that is um, the uh, the notification notification part of the CPU is uh, is very slow, at least on Xeon. And then and I could think about actually <laughs> a, a song got a long and a winding road because I can't really uh, describe you know the the microarchitecture details here, but it's it's a slow and expensive process. And also, the uh, the MSI write uh, has a strong ordering requirement with the DMA write, and the, all these combined as a result is that the uh, the IRQ rate has become you know a limiting factor for the I/O performance. So the slower the IRQ, the slower the DMA. So we measure that uh, on the Sapphire Rapids, which is the latest Xeon platform, and we attach two and four at the bottom line here, two, four, or eight disks to the same socket, and then we use FIO out of the box, uh, basically libAIO lib um, benching to measure the IOPS. You can see with two uh, with two drives and uh, the performance is about at the line rate as 2 million IOPS per second per disk. But when I have four, it drops to 1.1, and the eight, it drops less than half. So the performance drop is very, uh, very significant. So the proposal or the, the solution that came up with uh, this RFC patch I recently posted is that uh, since our system software, the kernel is given the ability to control uh, when and if the CPU notifications are sent. So basically we, we could um, uh, coalesce those notifications while the interrupts are coming at a high, high uh, burst or high frequency. So that's making a new use of the uh, posted interrupt capability. So we call it posted MSI and then call list interrupt delivery. So I want to illustrate this through this timeline here. The, light, the time flows from left to right. And uh, the high speed MSIs arrive uh, in a high frequency burst groups. So ABC here is in one group and the DFG in another group and HI, they are more uh, sparsely ar uh, arrived. So with post, uh, with a remappable interrupt on this RI row here, every single one of those MSIs will generate a notifications, even though the CPU is already say busy processing uh, MSI A, but and, you know B and C's notifications still sent to the CPU. So that's kind of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the are we there yet? Are we there yet? Uh, kind of uh, notification, and also it goes through this uh, long and winding road. This so is very slow. And uh, with post interrupt in this patch, what we wanted is only for the leading uh, MSIs of each burst, we allow a notification to be generated to the CPU. So it's a less uh, less uh, interference to the CPU processing. So uh, as, as a result, all the N and the right prime notifications are avoided. Uh, so this basically essential, you know, just call as those uh, notifications. I want to kind of pause for a moment because that's kind of the key idea of this optimization. So um, the posted interrupt is not exactly, you know, just a, just a simple replacement. There's some subtle differences I wanted to mention here. So all the, uh, all the MSI vectors here being multiplexed into one single notification vector. So from the CPU point of view, from the APIC point of view, there's no more MSI, you know, device driver MSIs arriving at the CPU directly and going through the IDT delivery, uh, interrupt descriptor table delivery. So, uh, another change is that uh, post interrupt, we lose some of the features that remappable interrupt supports. For example, uh, in remappable interrupt, you can say, I want to deliver this MSI as a NMI, non maskable interrupt, but here is not a choice. But I don't think we're using it today. Uh, the only thing I know about it was some uh, effort to do HPAT 
deliver as NMI for watchdog timer, but it's not in upstream. And, and also the delivery uh, destination is uh, physical only. That's, uh, that's fine with MSI because it's a unicast anyway, so you cannot do a cluster. And another interesting thing is that the, now the MSI vector space is actually a separate uh, namespace than the, uh, the APIC vector. So it's not subject to the local APIC restrictions where you have restrictions for the low and the high. The low is the, um, um, you know, the, the legacy interrupts and the systems. Uh, and the highest, like the oh, highest system interrupts, like timer and uh, other things. But it's still uh, to to really separate the vector space is a very uh, intrusive change. So in RFC, I didn't really do that, but it's in theory is possible. So with the RFC patch. Uh, um, Ben, I'm sorry, you have anybody has questions? Question for you, Jacob. I'm sure this is obvious yeah. to everybody else, but if you back up two slides. Um, yeah. Yeah, here, so you're elighting the MSIs. Um, so you, the OS will only see the, basically the first one. Um, so the MSI indicates completion of some DMA, right? So, mm -hmm. There's another mechanism, I guess, to, to make sure that, uh, for instance, um, MSI C, that transfer is actually completed. How, do, how does the driver know that that has been completed? Uh, it's still uh, completed in, in order. It's just, uh, actually, it's not uh, the MSI being callless in the PI line. It's not the same as the MSI. It's, the, uh, it's a different vector, it's a notification vector. It's not a, the actual device MSI's vector. So it's- uh, But it happens at the time of MSI A, right? Yes, yes. And then MSI, and then the post the intra, uh, you know, the MSI vector gonna go basically pull the memory for, see, to see which, uh, which uh, device MSI is uh, pending and then go process still in order. So from the driver point of view, it's transparent. I have to I have to more detailed slides in later. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Bjorn. I think I think what you're looking for, Bjorn, is that you want to see that the end prime, the excess, the last uh, with coalescing, you want to see the interrupt delivered with the last one of the burst, not with the first one. Is that correct? You want to see this them in order, right? Yeah, I, I right. think that's guaranteed. Uh, I, I I have the slide to explain later. It maybe become more clear. So I think I think Bjorn's concern is because of the ordering. The drivers assume that the data that they were the the IRQs the strong ordering that you mentioned in the first slide or previous slide was because data has to be visible in memory to the CPU that's handling the interrupt. That's the mm -hmm. assumption of MSI, mm -hmm. right? And so if you are delivering yeah. the interrupt earlier than the original IRQ, there's a potential for out of order interrupt handling. It's not really delivered early. It's just uh, being, uh, how can I say, uh, being, uh, so I've, it's still in order. So it just, uh, we'll try to look, only process the next one after we finish the, the first one. So there's no out of order. So I have the pseudo code and the trace later on to explain this. Okay, thank you. Bear with me. Sorry. Yeah. Sometimes code is easier to see. Yeah. Why do you need posted interrupts to do this? Couldn't you just scrub through the IRR and pull out pending interrupts before enabling IRQs if your goal is just to reduce the number of actual IRQs that are delivered to the core? Yeah, the the thing is that the expense expensive part is uh Deliver to IRR. That's the notification. So that's the the long and winding road, and uh, has been on Xeon. Yeah. So we try to avoid. Yeah. The the whole point of this optimization is to stop delivering to the IAR because that's the slow thing. In yeah, I had a in my uh, later slides. It, it, Sorry, it, it, it serializes the MA between the IOMMU and the CPU. Uh, 
Sorry, can you say it again? Sorry, I was answering a question in the room. <laughs> Sorry, so the, 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 the question was about delivering to the IIR and why that's the thing that we're attempting to optimize with this plan. Yeah, that's so, a more uh, ca ca carry on. Kind of micro architecture thing. And uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I forgot. That's, I think that's uh, so with the patch, and then we remeasure the same FIO, uh, you know, leave AIO test on the same Samsung Gen 5 NVMe drive. And the first row was A drives uh, on the same socket. And then so before and after, we gain quite a bit. Uh, uh, performance basically the old uh, either four a drive the first row and the second row the four drive and the both uh, can recover uh, back to the uh, to the line rate of a two million IOPS per second and then we also have a, uh, a, t a separate uh, test I made based on the, the uh, built-in data streaming accelerators this way you can pump millions of introps per second and from different devices and then, and also set our Q affinity to the same CPU. And you can see similar um, significant gains in our throughput with this mechanism. So this is the, the RFC patch here. And um, what we do notice that, I mean, for, in, uh, I guess from the, uh, the hardware point of view, both CPU and IMMU are doing atomic exchange to the same cache line to, you know, to update this memory location where interrupts are posted. So in, those are kind of expensive operation we try to avoid, but uh, we have not seen any uh, downside of turning on for every, every devices on the system. But we're continuing uh, evaluating, especially at the lower interrupt rates, uh, less than 1 million per second per CPU, we're not seeing any difference between this uh, patch with or without this patch. So uh, here is uh, one of the implementation choices I like to uh, discuss and uh, uh, get some feedback help uh, to get it uh, more uh, clean. And uh, the first is uh, um, I made this choice to be you know transparent to the device driver all the changes to just stay in x86 and uh, into uh, IMMU code and so also the interrupt mode uh, switching between uh, remappable to posted is a per interrupt option uh, but so that means you can do you know per device as well or system wide but I made a choice to be a system wide because and it's a lot First of all, you don't see any downside to make it system wide. And also, um, uh, when you have more interrupts, there are more chances to uh, call less. So you can call less between vectors, not just you know the vector itself, and keep posting. But I did exclude some of the, uh, some of the legacy devices and also uh, the IMMU's own IRQ because it's not posted, uh, it's, it cannot be posted. And because in the, in the loop, we could be uh, getting an interrupt storm. We keep, you know, polling for more, and there's always more to handle. So we wanted to uh, limit the number of uh, notifications for uh, polling, basically DMARC's loop, each time you get a notification. So give a chance for other things to run. And I have some data to show, like uh, what it would be the, the optimized, uh, the, the max loops. And so the changes are also limited to, in terms of interrupt domain, it's limited to the Intel uh, or the interrupt remapping chip uh, where it has some uh, changes, but it has no impact to the PCI, MSI, and the device drivers. So, so far, this, uh, this change is also x86 uh, Intel only, but you know, I'm not sure uh, this can be extended to other architectures. We we'll also have posted interrupts. I, I think uh, in the RISC five, and they all have that similar capability. Uh, even though it's it's made for virtualization, but I think the uh, the memory file or memory uh, resident uh, descriptor has the, the HPA, the host physical address. So there's, I think there's no uh, restriction with that it cannot be used on the on the host, but I'm not sure. Uh, I, that's why I need a help. And I look at AMD spec a little bit, 
and it seems they're pointing to the V, uh, the virtual APIC or, um, so that's that's why I need, a, need some feedback from other architectures. So on, on that in particular, it, what AMD, you have to point to the virtualization structure that ties the um, virtual APIC IDs of the vCPUs together. Uh, you mm. may be able to instead point that back at host state, but there's definitely more of the virtualization bits involved in the delivery of the interrupts after you've posted them into memory. I see. Thanks. Um, you, you've been measuring IOPS and, and seeing significant, significant improvement, but what about uh, latency? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, what happens when you do, uh, when you call this uh, networking MSI, for example. Yeah, the latency, uh, uh, you know, FIO gave you the latency, the, the completion latency. We didn't see any much difference. Uh, the reason this, uh, I, I can see from the, how this works actually from this uh, DMAX loop, how it works. Uh, so, so when you have, you know, interrupt MSI, say from network device or, or uh, NVMe comes to, to the system and they all got basically co collapsed into this uh, system vector, notification vector. So there's no matter, you know, have 200, but it only comes as one. And then inside this loop, uh, inside this, uh, we first, um, you know, do the prologue IRQ and then start this polling loop and uh, basically do an atomic, atomic exchange to get uh, what's pending in the memory, the posted interrupt descriptor. And then if it's pending, then we will call the IRQ handlers one by one for each bit the set. So if it's nothing pending, then they will just continue and just uh, just exit out of the loop. Uh, and then so, so there's no wait uh, for more. So you have to call up say five interrupts or three interrupts. So there's no no wait. So in that sense, um, the latency is just whatever it takes to execute those uh, handlers. There's no additional latency added. Uh, I think uh, some of the uh, device firmware coalescing scheme, they have to wait for a certain number of interrupts. So this way it adds some tail latency. But this case, uh, it just continue. Does it answer your question? Hey, um, I, I have a question. Have you compared this to the scheme where the device sends the MSI but then it needs to be rearmed before it will send more. I think the interesting thing about that approach is that the mm -hmm. device will not be spamming MSIs. I think in your scheme, all the MSIs are still being sent by the device and then they're basically being coalesced later. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was curious because I think some network cards do that. So um, what do you think about that approach? Yeah, um, actually, I've seen my uh, backups, right? The, the NVMe has some tuning parameters to to set coalescing there. But uh, the first of all is uh, is per devising, so you can only coalesce device itself. But here is more a generic uh, scheme, so you can coalesce across different devices, vectors, so it doesn't care. And, and also it's, you know, it doesn't need to uh, wait for more. It just, if there's nothing going on, and then it just naturally just continues. It will be returned to the same behavior as posted interrupt. I mean, as a remappable interrupt. Maybe that um, does it answer your question? Uh, kind of. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so one thing four you, minutes. Uh, yeah, come. Yeah, if you want to, uh, if you have questions for the audience, I mean, you. I think. Then you need to stop. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. So it, uh, if you run this patch, you're going to notice there's a new IRQ chip, and that's uh, the kind of IR post. And also, in terms of interrupt accounting, uh, there's one more uh, in the proc interrupts for the notification interrupts. So if you compare the number in the you know post PMN post 
posted MSI notification versus your MSI account, you can see uh, the ratio is the, uh, the, the coalescing ratio, basically. And uh, when I showed this uh, uh, proof of concept to Thomas uh, Glashner, he, he pointed out there's an issue with, uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this approach and uh, I'm still working on, but uh, basically is that uh, before this patch, the interrupt on the left, you know, arrives individually. So you handle the prologue and call the handler and handler does the EOI. Uh, and, and then just everybody, every, every interrupt is separate. So even though we don't allow preemption uh, within the handler, but system, you know, high priority system interrupt can still get in in between. But with this approach, uh, in the uh, in the the demultiplexing loop, which is called a handler, uh, you know, one by one, in the, without allowing uh, you know system interrupts uh, to come in or soft IRQs. So that's uh, adding some delays. In the in the loop, so that's one of the challenges. I and uh, I have made uh, three attempts to address this issue. First of all, seeing this patch is that we uh, we uh, uh, basically limited the number of uh, polling loop can be done. So with the the data showing that even if it's just call less two, three, four, I mean up to three, you already got ninety percent of the benefit. So. So this is uh, just an RRQ injection test. And actually here, I was trying to crack this that one means two, <laughs> two uh, one, max loop one means two coalesced because after the, uh, after the, uh, the coalescing loop, we have to do one more round to make sure there's no uh, leftover interrupts. So just by collecting two, three uh, interrupts, they already got 90% of the benefits. So in the in the in the RFC patch, I just just set it to three, and the possibly we can make it tunable. But it's probably easier just have a reasonable default, and we don't have to worry about it. And another attempt is try to make the uh, this notification vector, a notification handler, preemptible. And so basically, inside a handler, uh, I'm going to re-enable. The, uh, the interrupt, uh, local interrupt, and then and I, I had a disable interrupt here. So the runtime trace would look like uh, enter, and then when you re enable the interrupt handler, it happened to have a say a timer interrupt. So you would be you would be able to preempt your notification vector, but because we have collapsed every other MSI vectors into one, there's wouldn't be any nesting. Uh, other than this one. So the nesting only went deep. So we, we don't have a, a problem, I think, with the IRQ stack overflow. And I thought that was the, the main reason that uh, we don't allow uh, interrupt, uh, you know, nesting. But in here, we have only one, just, just one deep at most. Um, Jacob, I'm sorry, I need to ask you to wrap up. I don't know if there are questions from the audience or anything you want to ask, just go for it. Anything else you want to get from the audience? Any questions? Um, I think that's it. That's pretty much the last one. The, the, the third one is not really, a, the using IPI is not really a, good option is just uh, nullify the, the benefits. Yeah. So. Any further questions? I think you can take it offline then. Thank you very much, Jacob, for your presentation. Yeah, thank you.